Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. I'm here with another A-level chemistry exam question walkthrough. This video I'm focusing on calorimetry, which is common to all aspects of A-level chemistry, whatever exam board you're doing. But if you are studying AQA chemistry, it is required practical too, so even more important for you than for other people. If you want to download the questions and have a go at these yourself, then that's available in the description. And that way you'll be able to mark your work when you watch my video. And in this video, I will show you the thinking behind the question and explain things and write down my thoughts in blue and the answers that are going to get you the actual marks will be written down in green. We're going to look at a 13 mark question here that ranges through a few of the different ways that you can explore calorimetry. But before we start on the calorimetry, the first question asks us to state the meaning of the term enthalpy change as applied to a chemical reaction. So we're just defining a general enthalpy change, not a particular enthalpy change. And so enthalpy change generally is the heat energy change at constant pressure. And then part B does give us a very specific calorimetry experiment for us to analyse and unpick. And so in this calorimetry experiment, calcium carbonate, which is a solid, is being added to hydrochloric acid, and that will be an acid-base reaction, and we're making calcium chloride, salt, carbon dioxide, and water. So we've got a method that we can unpick, and in this method, they are adding certain quantities of the reactants together in a beaker, and they are stirring the mixture and recording the maximum temperature that is reached. And so the student then uses that data to determine an enthalpy change. So our commands kick in because they're asking us to explain how the experimental method and the use of apparatus can be improved to provide more accurate data and then describe how that data could be used to determine an accurate value for the temperature change delta T. And so what we need to recognise first is some of the limitations of the method that they've described to us. So they've talked about just simply recording the maximum temperature reached. They never actually talked about recording the starting temperature. So in fact, that's a little bit of a, an a issue in itself. But when we see a question that is asking us to determine an accurate value for the temperature change, what you need to be thinking there is that this is a method where we're talking about the extrapolation technique. And so that's where you draw a graph, which I'll just show at the bottom of the screen, where you draw a graph of got, which has got temperature on the y-axis and time along the x-axis. And so you record the temperature before you start of the solution. In this case, it would be the hydrochloric acid. And then you record the temperature at regular intervals and you don't record it at the point of mixing. And then you record the temperature at that same interval thereafter once the reaction has begun. And what you're doing is you're tracking that temperature decrease. And so for this six mark question, you need to describe the method that you would use that would allow you to collect the data to plot this graph and then extrapolate that graph to work out that more accurate value for delta T. And so this is a six mark question, and that's where they give you various levels, one, two, three, and level one is you're getting one or two marks, and level three, you're getting five or six marks. And broadly speaking, they always prioritize certain aspects of the experiment to allow you to access each level. And so the first aspect of the method that they want you to be stating is the apparatus. So you would need to say, I would use a burette or a pipette to measure my volumes of solution. And then I would carry out this experiment in a polystyrene cup rather than a beaker, because obviously polystyrene is a better insulator than glass is. And once I've measured my solid in a watch glass and transferred it to the polystyrene cup, I would re-weigh that watch glass to work out if I really have added everything that I thought I had, or have I actually just only measured 2.49 grams actually transferred into the polystyrene cup, and some of it was left behind in the watch glass. And I think another improvement is that the solid calcium carbonate is not really very clear what type of solid are we using. And so I would be explicit and expect to state we would use powdered calcium carbonate, for instance. So I think that first aspect, that's going to get us two marks if we unpick the logistics of the apparatus that we're using. 
And then for the second set of two marks, we need to be talking about the measurements that we're going to make during the experiment. And I've already said this, that we're going to be measuring the temperature both at the beginning, so the initial temperature of the solution, for a few minutes before we actually start the reaction going. And then we record the temperature again at regular intervals, so every minute or every half minute, for up to maybe eight minutes after the reaction has finished. And that allows us to observe a trend in the decrease in temperature. And then for the final two marks, you need to be talking about how you're going to use these data to work out the value for delta T overall. So you're going to plot the graph, as I've drawn at the bottom, but you need to say, I would plot a graph of temperature against time. And then you need to say again, I would extrapolate the best fit lines. You've got two best fit lines, one for prior to the mixing, which should be horizontal, and one afterwards. And you'd extrapolate those lines to the point of addition, say the fourth minute where you didn't actually measure the temperature. And extrapolating generally is where you continue a trend after the data runs out and you say, well, if we assume that that trend would continue, what value would we have at a particular point? And that's what I've done on my line. I've continued the horizontal and just assumed it would continue to be horizontal until we did something different. And the same thing about the decreasing temperature once the reaction is over. We just assume that actually if all of the energy had been given out in one go and the temperature did increase in one quick incremental increase, then that means that the maximum temperature can be extrapolated and deduced from the rate of decrease in temperature after the reaction has occurred. And so we would determine delta T at the point of addition by using this maximum temperature, subtract the starting temperature to work out our delta T. And then the question moves on to a different type of experiment. This time we're not adding a solid to a solution. This time we're adding two solutions together. And that has the, a key significance where we are going to be working with two volumes that are combining to give an overall volume of 50 plus 50. That means 100 centimeters cubed of solution will be in our polystyrene cup. And so what that means is when we're working out the temperature change or the energy transferred to the solution, it's to the whole solution, to that 100 cm cubed of solution or that 100 grams of solution as it turns out. And so they've asked us in this question to calculate the maximum final temperature of the reaction mixture given that it has started at 18.5 degrees C. And we can see from the question that it is an exothermic reaction because of the negative enthalpy change. That means that the temperature is going up, so we're expecting a final temperature to be greater than 18.5 degrees C. And so the first thing that we need to do is work out the moles of our solutions. Now, both of the moles are the same. And so what that means is we work out the moles of sodium hydroxide and we do concentration multiplied by volume. It needs to be in dm cubed, so we have to divide that by a thousand. And we get 0 0.025 moles of sodium hydroxide. Because the conch and the vol are the same for the acid, we'll have 0 0.025 moles of that as well. And so what that means is when we're working out our enthalpy change, we don't have anything in excess and nothing is limiting. So that means when we do work out our enthalpy in kilojoules per mole, we can use either of these two numbers because they are the same. We don't combine them. We use the moles of the limiting factor, which is both of them. They're both limiting. And so having worked out moles, typically we would then work out Q equals MC delta T and substitute the values in there. But this time, because the question is asking us for a final temperature change, we have that equation, but we actually don't know enough of the values to use it yet. And so we can rearrange it, though, in advance, and we can work out what delta T is equal to, in other words, Q divided by MC, which means that before we can use that equation, we have to work out what Q is. And since delta H is negative Q over N, that means that Q is going to be negative delta H times by N. So that means it's going to be minus 57.1 times by 0 0.025 times by minus 1, or simply 57.1 times 0 0.025, which gives us a value of 1.4275. This value will be in kilojoules because the enthalpy change is in kilojoules per mole. 
and Q typically needs to be in joules. So we need to multiply that value by a thousand. And so when we take that value for Q and we put it into our rearranged Q equals MC delta T expression, we have our value for Q in joules on the top of the expression, and then we're dividing it by 100 because that is the mass of the two solutions combined. And that's because the density of this solution we're told to assume is one gram per cubic centimeter. So we've got 100 cubic centimeters in total. So that is 100 grams. And the value for the specific heat capacity we're told is 4.18. And so what that means is that delta T is going to be 3.4 once we've crunched those numbers. And so we're asked not for delta T, we're asked for the final temperature. And so what that means is since we started at 18.5, the final temperature is going to be 3.4 degrees larger than that, which will be 21.9 degrees C for our fifth and final mark. The very final question here is asking us to suggest, which means that we haven't actually been told this ever explicitly, but we can work it out, suggest without changing the apparatus how we could reduce the percentage uncertainty in this temperature change. Well, to calculate percentage uncertainty, you use the absolute uncertainty, so that's the plus or minus value, divided by the measurement that we've made. Now, since they won't let us change the apparatus, that means that we have to be changing the measurement, because if we change the apparatus, that would be a way to adjust the, the absolute uncertainty. But they've told us that that's off limits. We can't change the apparatus. And so what that means is we can only change the measurement. And in order to reduce the percentage uncertainty, we need to be making that measurement larger. And if we're making the measurement larger, we must be adjusting our method to do that. And the way that we would do that is we would have a larger value for the concentrations of solution. And what that would do is that would make our measurement for delta T larger. And so if the value for delta T is larger, the value on the bottom of this expression gets larger. And so overall, the percentage uncertainty goes down because when the temperature changes 3.4, that's pretty small. And so the percentage error with that, the percentage uncertainty is gonna be pretty big. Whereas if the temperature change was 10 times that value, the percentage uncertainty would be 10 times smaller and therefore we can be more confident in our measurements. Okay, that's the end of this question. That's the end of the video. Hope it was useful. I'll see you again soon.